Hello, this is part two of our 678 week one in the spring of 2024. It is not the fall of 2024. That was my brain telling me the raw six months ahead, my brain is working, but still the spring, it's still January. It's not even spring, it's winter, right? So here we are in the midst of our winter. What are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna read a lot about learning technologies, about digital technologies, about various ways in which human learning has be, is being transformed in front of our eyes every moment of the day. We're getting news about something that's happening that's impacting education. It could be formal education, could be informal education, could be online, could be blended, could be face-to-face, -face, could be some other delivery mode like television and radio. Education is happening all the time in front of our eyes. And we've got to make sense of that because the world has become open for learning. And hence, I've got a book somewhere in this stack of books called The World is Open. I hate to, I've got a uh, stack of books here. And if I pull one out, everything is going to fall. So I better not. Yeah, there it is. So the world has become open for learning. <laughs> my prop, my one prop left. And I was asked in Japan to give a keynote in um, Matsui, Japan, at the International Conference on Computers and Education a month ago, a month ago on December 9th. A, a fascinating conference, had a lot of fun, but it's hard to be the, the speaker at the last day because you're hearing everybody else and you get more nervous, but the cultural events were phenomenal. Um, phenomenal, it was a lot of fun. So here's what I've put together, and I'm going to you know, present this talk, and we'll see if it makes sense to all of you. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get to my slides here in just a second. It's called, It's Time to Wake Up from Your Innovative Learning Dreams and Make Smarter Learning a Reality. And so we'll see if I can. Can you see that, Bo? Great. All right. So I'm going to, again, try and hide before I had trouble hiding my floating panel, high floating meeting. Okay. Um, there's different things I've, I'm trying to hide. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So, you know, hopefully we're not sleeping through this class. Anyhow, <laughs> if you want my notes, if you want to download all my notes, every talk I give is put up in training share. One word, training share. Bogey and type in the trainingshare.com. Look under archived talks. So just trainingshare.com. And Bo can go up and look and can you give us all the link to that maybe. Um, so yeah, it's time to wake up and make smarter learning a reality. Now this is smart learning. This is smart learning, you know, nearly 30, uh, no, nearly a hundred years ago, during the 1930s, people were learning from the radio. People were learning from correspondence. And then a decade or two later, people are learning from televisions. Another decade or two later, people are learning from Plato, not Plato the the philosopher, but Plato, the system that was developed at the University of Illinois, which had touch screens, which had databases, which had word processing, which had you know, basically at the start of email, which had video connections, conferencing, computer-based education was, was really kicked off there at Illinois. People got smarter with these new learning environments, touch screens, touch screens, 1960s. We think this is new today. It's not so new. People have been learning different strands, different forms, different delivery mechanisms of technologies really since Plato's time, because he, you know, at that time we had books and people could listen to Plato and Academos and go travel back home to another country and read the book. That was distance learning. That was, you know, forms of correspondence types of learning. Today we have open, online, distance, blended, all these different formats. If just one of these things that happened to be a transformation, but it's dozens and dozens and dozens of things have happened, including the pocket calculators. Pocket calculators created this, this new age that, you know, when not when Bo was going to school, but pretty close. When he was going to high school, people had pocket calculators. And I'm, I'm, I'm not making you that old, Bo, I'm sorry. But, but we did I have was, them. <laughs> you, you did, did, you use, did your teachers let you use them? Uh, every now and then we were allowed to. Yeah. yeah. How about stat classes in, in college? 
Um, I didn't take one until last semester. <laughs> and who'd you take that with? Oh man. Um, and you don't I even remember. Okay. Can't remember. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, the, the, it was, it was a challenging class. So we'll just put it that way. <laughs> we got to have four uh, index card of notes, no calculators, no uh, digital pocket calculator or anything. Yeah. And my stat in college, anyhow, with Dr. Joel Levin back in the days, a long time ago. Oh, you still even, <laughs> Yeah, I remember his name. Sure. I had him for three classes and he's famous. He, you have heard the APA manuals. He yep. created, he was the head of the APA like four or five. I mean, he's a pretty smart guy. You've heard of mnemonics? He did research yep. on mnemonics. He's, you know, Joel, look him up, Joel Levin. He wrote, you heard of Simon and Garfunkel? He met Simon and Garfunkel and he wrote some music and he asked him if, he, <laughs> if he'd like it. I think it was he met Simon and, they, and Simon said, no, I have a partner back home in New York named Garfunkel. But was, you know, anyway, Joel Levin, real interesting guy. So, you know, learning to code isn't, isn't enough. You know, today we have to think about who's learning to code and, and some, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion issues and getting people access to these technologies, getting the proper training and so forth. They can be smarter, but we have to create the systems and, and the procedures to, to enable people to utilize and reflect on what they're doing and then, um, you know, implement in the real world. Anyways, we're, we're continuing to build, build, build other technologies that are happening in front of us. And today we have these things called smart learning devices, which we get to in week 15. The smart learning suite delivers lessons to students, evaluates their lessons, let students collaborate on these lessons, all sorts of things. And, you know, it has a, a, a number of, you know, uh, tools that are built within it, uh, learner portfolio tools, learner assessment tools, learner um, profile tools, all these things that create a more, hmm, uh, an environment that's more adaptive to students' needs. It's called adaptive learning or personalized learning, right? But yet we've got kids looking at screens. Where's the emotional side to all of this, I ask? You know, we have to think about, you know, students not just, you know, typing in their keyboards and, and, and getting feedback from the system, but what are they really getting in terms of social skills and emotional growth within these, uh, we might get cognitive gains, but what about behavioral gains? Well, what about social learning, social emotional learning gains? So again, I, I think these smart learning environments are often very limited in thinking about technology solutions to a particular problem and not thinking about the entire system that's being designed to affecting the ecosystem that might be put in place for students to, to, to um, grow. And then we advance into today, we got all this inundation of AI, the AI you know, boom that's happened during the past year to two years. And I'm currently listening in my car to an AI book and on my jogging trails to a book. Um, I can tell you what the title is, it's in my phone. So every day I'm, I'm getting new lessons myself. Um, it's called The Brief History of Artificial Intelli Intelligence. A Brief History of Artificial Intelligence is the book I'm listening to and I highly recommend it by David Woolbridge out of the UK, famous AI scientist. So we got AI impacting the business world and making you know, an impact in cons consultants reports and so forth and, and maybe replacing people in the not too distant future. We got AI making an impact in terms of image recognitions. You can see in 2000, it had handwriting recognition in 2005, speech recognition, 2010, image re recognition, 2015, start of reading comprehension, 2020 language understanding. And now we've got these large language models, which like ChatGPT out there in 2022, now 23 and 24. But um, lot of, this has happened fast. The, this AI has been around for a while. Before I went to grad school a long time ago, I invested all the money my mom saved for my life insurance in an AI company that went kind of unethical and went out of business. My mom wasn't too happy with me. Um, so yeah, I've 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 seen these AI has come in cycles. It's gone. It's it, it, there's been uh, there's been many AI winters as they call them. You know, there's been AI booms, and there's a winter when they they overhype it. Um, but this time, this time could be different. You know, um, AI uh, tools have you know as I said, better image resolution because of the GPUs. Um, 
much faster than it's ever been. You can see pictures that's built from 2016 to 2023 here in front of our eyes, the, the, the quality of the image that, you know, for whether it's a, 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 a different animal or species or a different um, fa fabrication within one, one's house. So AI has exploded because you look at the chart on the left, shows the mean number of operations a GPU can perform in a set in a second, okay? And this is only gonna increase. Even the ability to create poetry, haku poetry in particular, has dramatically changed in the past five years. So, you know, people are taking notice. People are taking notice of this. And one day, uh, you know, Sam Altman's getting an award. He gets this Stephen Hawking award in the UK. And the next day he's being fired by the board of directors at, you know, at um, OpenAI. And the next day he's being hired back. You know, and a lot of craziness happening out there in this interesting world of AI today. You know, this is just recent news. I feel kind of sorry for the guy, but um, but he was saved. Everyone's going to quit their job at OpenAI if, they, if they, they did fire him. And workplaces are being transformed, you know, and how they're transformed is going to, it's kind of an unknown factor, but, you know, consultants reports here, G, uh, GPT-4 boosted uh, strategy consultants' performance in speed by 40% and 25%. That performance was higher for lower skilled than higher skilled consultants. So are the hired skilled consultants going to lose their jobs and we'll keep the lower skilled consultants? No, I don't know. I don't know. And that's why I left the business world a long time ago. I was worried about my job. <laughs> I'm an accountant or a CPA back in the long, long, long time ago. Uh, look at the number of jobs that, you know, in, in particular impacting people with master's and doctoral degrees, 57% and 28% uh, with, uh, without generative AI, 57%. Share of work that can be automated. Share of the work, 57% with generative AI of master's and PhD work, 28% without generative AI. But you can see no high school degree, 63% um, with generative AI, 54% without. So it doesn't make a big difference there. So knowledge workers are the going to be hit pretty bad, I think. Um, and about schools, every day in schools, we're hearing about the impact on inquiry-based learning and you know, um, how it's affecting us in terms of, you know, being able to score their exams more quickly and so forth. Teachers, teachers are using AI for research, lesson plans, synthesis, testing. Students are using it to understand the material and to help them study faster. See, 73% of kids, students are saying, yeah, I'm using it to help me learn. 67% you know, help these study faster. 73% to understand the material. Research, teachers, 44% are teachers are using it for research. Like, you know, Bo is using it for research, STEM-related research. Generating lesson plans, 38%. And I'm sure Bo's, Bo's right, you're using it for lesson plans. Uh, tons, yes. Yeah. Are you an administrator or a teacher or both? Uh, neither. I'm a consultant. <laughs> oh, even... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I taught and then um, worked at the Department of Ed, and uh, now I, I do consulting work for uh, schools that are upping their STEM programming. Yeah, now you have perm you have job security. That's right. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, maybe I do too. I don't know. So, and AI is in higher ed for sure. You read the Chronicle of Higher Ed. You read Inside Higher Education. You read almost you know East E. Uh, campus news, tons of AI every day. You know, it's hard to hard to actually get off my chair and read something other than AI news. <laughs> Just it, it, we're inundated with all this. The, the special issues I've assigned in this class is the easy way out. I didn't go and look for my own new tidbits and so forth. I've been indexed. Actually, I've been saving all the tidbits for two years, and I didn't put them in the syllabus. I've been, they're waiting. They, they've all, I've saved every one. ChatGPT can help Harvard freshmen pass their courses. A student went to her professor and said, I'm going to use ChatGPT for the final. And all the professors said, okay, it's an experiment. We're going to 
and and she submitted. She got an A in microeconomics, macroeconomics. She got an A in conflict resolution. She got an A in American presidency. She got a B minus in Latin American politics. She got a B in Spanish, intermediate Spanish. She got a C in freshman expository writing. She passed all her classes using ChatGPT. The, the headline is ChatGPT could pass freshman year at Harvard. Well, she didn't prove that. They made that heading, uh, you know, they had to get people to read the article. That's not exactly what she did, but, you know, that's in the Chronicle of Higher Education in July this past year. In November, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Flower Darby, that's her real name is Flower, you know. Um, okay, all right. It's a good person. Now she's, a, she's around a lot. She does a lot of research on pedagogy and training on pedagogy. She says we re need to rethink our resistance to chat GPT. And I agree. On the one hand, we got professors saying ChatGPT is exciting as a Twinkie. <laughs> On the other hand, saying it's a revolution. So I did a talk in November on pedagogy with AI. I'm going to do another one in February, February 8th, on pedagogy with AI. And I'll invite you all in innovative pedagogy. And there was a, a Chronicle of Higher Ed special issue on will AI change higher ed? Well, one side says, AI can enhance the pleasures of learning. On the other hand, someone said, don't believe all the hype. It's just another bubble, a technology bubble. Other people like Dana Boyd, pretty famous person, were asking the wrong questions. Our panicked reaction to AI is what needs re-examining. Another person says, AI will make us make the university more human. There's a lot of opinions out there as to where we're going to go. But the one source I like is my friend Ray Schroeder, who was a guest a year ago in my uh, R622 class. It was a year, a little over a year ago. And Bo really liked his presentation about AI and how it's going to impact higher education. Well, I go to his website when I need to find out something because he has read everything. And he blogs. His blog is phenomenal. He's won awards for it on new technologies in education, particularly online learning and blended learning. But he says we need to think about personalized learning. A chatbot can act, act as a, a virtual tutor, providing personalized assistance to students. It can ask, answer questions, offer explanations, provide additional resources. It's a, it's a language learning tool. Chatbots can help students improve their language skills, engage in conversations, correct grammar, vocabulary lessons. Be, uh, provide an immersive experience. He said uh, we can also have virtual study groups with AI. Chatbots can facilitate the study groups, connect students together with similar interests and in studying same areas, can help schedule meetings, provide discussion prompts, can moderate the conversation, um, can be an uh, AI can be an assessment tool, a feedback tool. Chatbots can be used to instant feedback on quizzes, then evaluate answers and provide explanations. It also can be a museum guide for, you know, for subjects like art. A chatbot can be a, a virtual museum guide providing information on artists, on exhibits, on historical events. So lots of ways to use AI and, and the impact of AI would be uh, undoubtedly tremendous. The U.S. Department of Ed has got a new report on AI and the future of teaching and learning. For your final assignment, you can evaluate this report. That'd be a great thing to do. You know, if you want to learn more about AI, why not read the U.S. Department of Ed report on technology? AI technology, I should say. Or you could read UNESCO. UNESCO's got a great report, Guidance for Generative AI in Education and Research. It came out in September of 2023, whereas the U.S. Department of Ed report, again, came out in June 2013. I have to be careful. I have to move things around just to read the dates. So, um, so yeah, you could read UNESCO, you read Department of Ed, you could Commonwealth of Learning report that I had up there earlier on Smart Learn. There's, there's thousands of reports you could pick and just pick one. So UNESCO's, what's interesting, UNESCO's report, they talk about different teacher roles or instructor roles of the AI system itself as a Socratic opponent, AI acts as an opponent to develop your arguments. Students enter prompts into ChatGPT following the structure of a conversation or debate. Teachers <clears throat> can ask students to use ChatGPT to prepare for lessons. It could be a personal tutor. 
AI tutors each student and gives immediate responses um, on their test scores or on their papers. It could be a collaboration coach. AI helps groups uh, helps groups to to research and solve problems together. It could be all these different things. There are many roles that it can play on. And there actually is a website now, AI Tools for Teachers. So those of you teaching the K-12 space, like Kennedy was saying, she might go to this website, AI Tools for Teachers, and evaluate the software tools that are listed in this website for her final task in this class. Simple as that. So while you're reading the syllabus, and there's, you know, there are some examples of what you can do, you know, hopefully you can find your own path, your own resources that you're interested in. One of the resources you might be interested in is from Contact North in Canada. They have a website called Teach Online, where I offered my webinar in November. I'm going to do one in February on pedagogy. They've developed two tools, an AI tutor and an AI teacher tool that I had Dr. Ron Ostin at York University present last semester in R622. They have a paper called Five Steps to Leverage ChatGPT in Your Teaching. Okay, so 10 facts about ChatGPT. They have all these free resources and free webinars. They, they have some brilliant people, uh, other than me, they, and I wouldn't put myself in the case, but these other people, they bring them in, really smart people, and they give free webinars. I mean, it's just, these, these resources are phenomenal. Um, one thing that Dr. Ray Schroeder told me about was chat PDF. And I like chat PDF because you can put any PDF document in under 100 pages for free, like a dissertation, and have it generate things like questions for students when they defend their dissertations. I did that. Um, but I also put my own papers in here, as you can see, on the trail of self-directed learners. And I had Mina Ju, who's going to be a guest in here in two weeks ago, her paper with me um, that's uh, just been published. And had it, I had to generate a set of questions that, you know, or a set of key points. What were the key points that ChatGPT thinks I was making in this article? There's another tool Dr. Schroeder told me about. It's called Hey PI, or just PI for short, where you can have a conversation with the AI tool to help you with your psychosocial emotional state. It can help teachers and students deal with burnout or deal with something that might be upsetting them that day, right? So that might be a tool that you might take a look at. So there's all these extra tools, exclusive here. OpenAI explores how to get ChatGPT into classrooms. What? This is in Reuters, in Reuters News. Exclusive. It says exclusive. Look at that. OpenAI explores how to get ChatGPT into schools. You think? This is this is breaking news, right? Breaking news? AI's been making an impact for decades. It certainly should be getting to schools in some ways. If this is breaking news, uh, we've got a lot of training, a lot of educating, and a lot of things to think about in terms of <laughs> teacher training and professional development. Breaking news, breaking news. I mean, right? This is, no, it's not breaking news. So it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And so on the count of three, if you all could share with me, we're all gonna say it's time, time to wake up. One, two, three. It's time to wake time up. To wake up. Yeah, to wake up. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's try it again. One, two, three. It's time to wake time up. To wake up. Time, to wake up. <laughs> time to wake up. I'm going to wake you up with 30 ways that learning is changing in front of our eyes. And I'll try and get this. We'll see how far we are in 20 minutes or so and maybe finish this up next week. We'll see. So learning is becoming more engaging, more accessible, and more customizable. I'm going to take my suit off because it's a little bit hot in here. And um, yeah, that's long enough. <laughs> ah, that's better. So I've been, I wrote an article in 2016 for folks in New Zealand that was published in a flex, flexible learning journal in New Zealand. It's an open access journal. You can type in a YouTube search, just 30 ways learning's changing with my name and you can get this article for free. Um, you can do this, but Bo, you might be able to look this up and type the URL in um, for everyone. 
And so one way learning is changing is engaging, engagement. With mobile learning, with you know hands-on learning, with touch screens, right? With uh, maker spaces, with more gamification of one's learning environments and VR and AR and all these immersive worlds and learning adventures that we could have. It's learning is becoming more engaging. Even though we got people critiquing it and saying, ah, education, no, everyone's going, no, learning has become, and people are starting to understand engagement better than they did 10 or 20 years ago. I had a student try to do a dissertation on engagement and she gave up. She gave up. She couldn't define engagement. She couldn't come up with an instrument for engagement. But now, 15 years later, there are a lot of instruments that look at engagement. And a lot of people think about engagement, more visual, more social, more touch censored, more digitally rich. You know, but yet instructors post pandemic are struggling with engagement. Students are disengaged more than they've ever been before. Students don't want to be lectured at anymore like I'm doing to you right now. I'm not going to lecture a lot this semester. In fact, one critique from the fall was they asked for more lectures from me. So I'll tr I'm going to try and provide a little more lectures. Um, people think I maybe know something. Or, uh, after teaching this class for the, this long, I should know a little bit, but it changes all the time. So there's an engagement crisis. And what can we do about that? Well, we can dis we can train learning experience designer. So Niels Floor from the Netherlands was a guest last semester. It was also my podcast show. He's does, He created the, the term learning experience design, right? And a uh, fascinating guy. And then on the right there, Mark Miller and Kim Rond came to my podcast show a year ago to talk about um, learning experience design, how Western Governors University and other universities out there are, are creating a new master's degree in learning experience design. So instead of calling them instructional designers, Australia and the UK are calling them flexible learning consultants. People in the Netherlands are calling them learning experience designers. I much prefer the title of learning experience designer, flexible learning consultants to instructional design. Instructional so design, I, I, it just sounds so boring to me. You know, I mean, it's like being an accountant. I was totally bored as an accountant. Let's make it a little more glamorous, you know, like a smart learning at a creator developer or something, you know, anyhow, we need to create ecologies for learning. You need to create the environments that get people to interact. And here last semester, we started off with a Padlet. Remember, Bo, we had the, the Padlet. These are some of the students, maybe a couple of people are in here um, just to, you know, get people to interact and, you know, we'll... Here, Lena's in there. There's Lena. Okay, I'm not sure if she left tonight or not. Lena, you still with us? No, she's probably gone. But anyway, you're in there. And then Lucy and so forth. And Therese will be tomorrow night in my class. Uh, learning's more collaborative. So these, these young people, from they're originally from Afghanistan. And they escaped on the last flight out, or one of the last flights out of Kabul, when the Taliban took over the country again a couple of years ago. They went to Bangladesh. And they are working at the American University of Women in Bangladeshi. And they wrote a book together called Strong Schools in press books. Now, one of the assignments, you can do a press book. One of the second last one in here is to create a press book. And Bo, remind me uh, later that I should send everyone the link to the Strong Schools press book, if I can find that, as an example or add it to the syllabus. So, you know, people are, are finding unique ways to collaborate. And the last assignment in here was a, a Wikibook chapter. So we had students in, as I said, in Houston and Indiana and China and Taiwan, all writing a book together. Sometimes people write a book together and then read the book that they wrote, making it really interactive and engaging, you know, really, you know, personal and relevant and meaningful and authentic. That's the way learning should be, right? And so those are my podcast partner, Punya Mishra in the middle. Chris Didi is the one holding his hand up, who I mentioned earlier, offered the AI Institute back in 1990. Uh, Young Zhao, who got us all to do the podcast, is on the right there, and so forth. Learning is more mobile. As I said, you know, we've got mobile learning is, you know, was going to be the thing for a Decade and a half, people are like, oh, mobile, 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 mobile. Yeah, some some degree it did turn into mobile. Mobile screens are kind of small. And so 
Samsung and LG and Sony are building fold-out screens to have bigger screens to be looking at and read full-length novels on, right? That will happen. But also have smaller stuff as well. Now, I got a Fitbit for Christmas. It's kind of small. My dog, my dog ate the extra band that came with it. I got a little worried he might not get through it. So he really ate it, didn't just chew it and spit it out. Um, he didn't get the Fitbit itself or the, the band I'm using. He got the extra band. But uh, we, that's one thing we got to worry about with these small technologies. Your dog's going to eat them if they get too small. <laughs> but Mark Nichols interviewed me for his podcast show. He interviewed all sorts of ed tech uh, researchers and celebrities out there around the world. It's a great podcast show. There's tons of ways to learn from podcasts and from blogs and, and, and YouTube videos and other things, TED Talks. It's not the way... Bo and I were trained back when we were in college or in high school students. Learning is much different today. Learning is more on the fly, in the bus station, on, on, in the subway, uh, in the airport concourse, in the cafes, in the brew pubs, you know. I mean, if I was going to Wisconsin today, I'd be at the pub. I, I, I didn't drink any beer my first two years as a grad student, or first year. I'd be sitting there learning, just ordering non-alcohol beer, and just learning in the in the pubs off my mobile phones and my my smart my because great pubs there just great atmosphere just to hang out you know or cafes go to Panera or go to Starbucks I'm not a coffee drinker I gave up coffee a long long time ago but just hanging out and being with social you know being with other people and you know feeling the excitement the exuberance of everyone's learning together especially in Korea ah the 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 cafes in Korea are like learning spaces. I mean, it's just phenomenal learning space. I know we've got at least one Korean here, you know, just it's, it's like the ultimate experience. You don't have to pay a fee, like entering college or something like that. It's all free. You just go to a cafe to, to hang out and learn. Learning is more digitally rich. My colleague, He Young Ann from William Patterson University does STEM and STEAM research, hands-on, minds-on, hearts-on, social on. She was a guest a year ago in me, either my 511 or 622 class, um, you know, making, you know, integrating arts in these maker lab spaces with science and mathematics and other kinds of things based on tinkering, thinkering, making, sharing, and reflecting, which is called the TMSR model she's using, getting people to put stuff out their work in Padlet, put create a short video, create a picture, and explain what the projects you're working on, and your parents and grandparents can come take a look at your projects, these digitally rich projects. You can defend them. You can, you know, communicate what you're doing. You're learning all sorts of skills by having this be a shareable space and shareable place. It's much more rich than a collaborative napkins in a restaurant, right? These spaces for sharing images. And now you can have Dolly create images, right? And so you can point out what's new things in these images that go in and you can help students learn their languages by showing, you know, a, a llama, you know, drinking mango juice at a beach, creating an image of a llama wearing a tropical hat, drinking mango juice, and then having students write a story about that, right? <clears throat> that could impact their learning of a, a particular language. Learning is more game-like. My friend Paul Kim at Stanford came in last semester in 622 and showed us his SMILE program, Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environment, the SMILE project. The SMILE project lets kids ask questions and of each other or of the system, and the SMILE system will rank the levels of questions that kids ask. So it becomes a competition to ask, becomes a competition to, to beat another team and asking the higher level of questions. There are kids in that in, in Thailand, kids in Indonesia, kids in India, kids in Korea there uh, with Paul. Now, Paul's originally from Incheon area of Korea and moved to U.S. when he was an undergraduate student. <clears throat> and is at Stanford Research, in, well, Stanford School of Education, the College of Education. And my son and him went to Tanzania, went to Argentina to have kids do this smile project there. But Paul's been to Rwanda, been to Palestine, Israel, 
been to uh, Honduras and Mexico, working with migrant worker kids in Mexico who have no teachers and create the teacher, the pocket school teacher or the teachers in your pocket kind of thing with uh, all simulations and games that teach physics and math and science all. So the physics person, Riza, and you might read about Paul Kim's work. Anyhow, we have the gamification of learning with the wordles on the right, on the left, and smile on the right. And, and this has got an AI system backing it up behind it. And so some of you might do a final project on the smile system. You might interview Paul Kim and ask him about the smile, read his papers, and maybe try it out. It's free to download. It's a free download for school. So Kennedy could download it with her kids, and her kids would be doing the smile project and so forth and, and all that. Or, you know, you might get involved in immersive worlds, like, you know, these, these immersive world um, metaverse, metaverse spaces, metaversities, to learn anatomy and biology and physics and chemistry and, and uh, first year medical school and that kind of stuff, to be immersed in these high resolution, high fidelity situations where learning about the cardiovascular system, we're learning about um, different um, physiology and uh, of the human species or of an animal and so forth. So learning is more immersive. Learning is more immersive with holographic images. My former student in the middle there, um, Maria Salamu from Cyprus, uses holographic images in the training of corporate people in Cyprus. Um, pretty fascinating. Holograms to boost student engagement. So you're bringing in someone from a remote location to discuss something, and it looks like they're really in the room with you. That's pretty cool. So it's time to wake up. One, two, three, everyone with me. It's time to wake up. It's time, time to, to wake, wake up. up. Let's try wake this up. again. Yeah, one, two, three. It's time to wake it's up. Time. It's, it's time, time to wake up. Time wake up. It's almost time to end, I think, right? So maybe we can do one more trend and then we'll save trend three for next time and the end. So we'll do the trend two, make a trend number two, pervasive access. So learning is, you know, we've got all sorts of ways to get education today. We no longer have a scarcity, right? In the past, we had books. We buy these books. They cost a lot of money. These, no, not everyone could afford them. So it's scarce. Not everyone could print them out. Today, we have digital stuff free to download typically if you have the technology if you have the mobile device to put on now we have leapfrogging in, taking place in countries in south america and africa so they can jump they don't have a desktop computer they have the, the tablets or they have the smartphones and they download and they get the videos they get you know, open educational resources and the MOOCs and open courseware and all this stuff online and blended and all this so Pervasive access, ubiquitous, almost just global. And, you know, young people today are starting to, to take online courses instead of coming to campus, instead of coming to Indiana or some other university. They want to get their digital marketing degrees or video production or coding, but they don't want to go four years to college anymore. They don't want to even go two years to college anymore. They want to go six months. They want to go for six weeks and get paid $100,000 at the end by learning Python programming or something. So, you know, there's a surge in undergraduate online education and we need to know if it's working or not. And the reports from Stanford and Harvard and uh, MIT that came out as the pandemic was winding down a bit and people got their shots, they did these big reports and that could be your final project, analyzing the new Stanford report or the Harvard report. And we did a special show on my podcast, um, silver lining for learning on these reports. In fact, Chris Didi was the host for that those shows, the head host. And uh, they said that this is the new normal. We're not going back to the way it was. We're not going back. Most classes will no longer be face-to-face. -face. A lot of them will be online permanently. Some will be blended, but it's not going to go back to like 95% being face-to-face -face anymore. And, 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 and we're not just going to be local. People will learn with kids around the world. They will learn musical instruments and play them with students in other countries. We'll have discussions like tonight with students from around the world. Now, the woman on the left-hand side in white, um, her name is Mahabali from American U of Cairo. I was in her class 
um, last semester in September. I was in Cairo and got to visit American U of Cairo, and she's done a lot in the field. She, You might take a look at her work in teaching languages online and other things. Learning is more synchronous. On the left-hand side, we got kids in rural parts of China and middle part of China. Their parents might have moved to more urban areas in eastern China, and they're left behind. These kids are left behind with their grandparents to raise them, and they have English training coming in in a synchronous fashion. Uh, one of my students studied this for her dissertation. Her name is Charan. I could bring Charan in as a guest in this class. She has a chapter in my book, Transformative Teaching Around the World. Um, and so, yeah, she studied these kids and what they, how they were learning through, you know, English, where they didn't have English teachers in Central and, and Western China. And then on the right-hand side, we had a conference to Korea and Australia, and I was the keynote coming in from America. And these are just a typical kind of thing. I mean, I'm doing like 10 or 20 or 30 of these a year where I'm a guest coming in from another country and there's all these people from around the world. It's just learning is more synchronous, like tonight. It's case in point, right? And learning is more video-based. We'll create a playlist of this class like I did last semester, and you can watch the playlist in two years from now, three years from now, whatever. So learning is more video-based. YouTube-versity, Arizona State called YouTube-versity. They're giving people degrees for watching YouTube videos. Not degrees, course credit. They're giving people course credit for watching YouTube videos and reflecting on them and writing papers on them. But, you know, when we've got the, all these contents, we need to mine it curate it, make sense of it, distribute it, and, and categorize it in a way in which people can readily use and may, make sense of. There's a new tool called Pictory. Now, I haven't used Pictory, but my colleague He, he Jung An did. <clears throat> in higher ed, online instructors might have lecture notes that they want to change to videos. Many times it is hard for us to create videos by ourselves and we lack time and we lack skills. <clears throat> people can use Pictory, can choose background images and voice male or female voices, different accents. Some students don't want to read articles. Instructors can turn them into audio or video files for them to listen to. Instructors can post them in different formats, audio and video formats, like audiobooks. Younger generations might like that. And the link, if you download my slides, you can play it. It's kind of fascinating. So instead of just lecture notes, you kind of create a video on your lecture notes. I mean, pretty cool. What do you think, Bo? Is it a... Something you might try? Yeah, I'm I'm actually on the site right now. <laughs> I was I was just about to check it out. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not a free tool, but there might be a freemium. It might be one of those where oh, once you see what what what's available for free, and let it looks us like know. you have a free trial on this one, and okay. then um, and then it jumps to a nineteen nine nineteen dollar a month pricing plan. Oh well, nineteen dollars a month. If it if I used it enough, I, I could. Just, I'm not gonna get it yet, but maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Then we got podcast shows. As I said, here's my podcast show. We brought in people from around the world. And every week we have, we've been going since COVID, March 21st of 2020. I've been running every day since March 21st of 2020. That's 1,385 days ago or so. And uh, we bring in penguin researchers from Antarctica. We bring in language learning inst instructors from Brazil, now living in Europe. The guy on the right there knows 16 languages. The guy on the, on the left knows 16. The guy on the right knows only 14 languages. They have a company called Language Boost. Um, but we've interviewed them for our research. And yeah, so anyone can be on your podcast show. Those You want to learn Norwegian, Finnish, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Bulgarian, Spanish. He knows all of them. All of them. And English. And Portuguese. And Spanish. You know? And then these guys were also my guests uh in in my class uh in in my podcast show i should say but they were also at the conference i was at in japan so i was able to pick on them um a little bit um and the guy on the left i should go back here the guy on the left here um kichit kichit louis he'll he's in he was in in singapore he's now in hong kong he might be a guest he, i think he probably will be a guest on february 26th or 27th in here he did a special issue that I'm going to bring him in to talk more. Now, these people teach you languages online. They use ChatGPT to teach languages, and I've been interviewing them and how they're using ChatGPT for things like video quizzes and, and grammar lessons and, 
you know, glossaries and all sorts of things that they're using. So yeah, we're studying chat, use of chat GPT to, for language learning, um, conversation practice, simulating life, life experience dialogues, vi vocabulary expansion by looking at for synonyms and antonyms for words and different phrasing, grammar and syntax, grammar rules and sentence rules, sentence, grammar topics and sentence formations, writing practice, utilizing ChatGPT to improve your writing skills, writing, helping with essays and creative writing and again, grammar, cultural insights and all sorts of things. So yeah, there are many roles that we're gonna still, you know, find. so learning is more informal Learning is more informal and more video-based, both. Learning is also more immediate. So when they find a 46,000-year-old worm in the permafrost in Siberia that is alive, possibly, and can revive it, this can get in the news and get kids excited about science the same day, back in July 2023, the same day scientists find out, kids in schools can find out. When they thaw a colossal squid in Wellington, New Zealand and put on Discovery T Channel, kids are learning about, you know, the, it has eyes the size of soccer balls and translucent body and, you know, can bring down ships with its claws. Well, I made up the last one. But anyways, you know, when they find a 300,000 year old skull in China, you know, again, these learning media elements can find their ways into K-12 education and higher education. And learning is more immediate. It just is. Learning is more free. It just is. Learning is more open. It just is. When this woman won the CNN Hero of the Year Award, and she agreed to be on my podcast show, I've yet to get her to get, commit to a date, but she's refurbishing computers. She's in Chicago. She's in refurbishing computers. I think she's a Bears fan, by the way. Uh, Bo, uh, she's another <laughs> she's sad, sad today. She's sad. She's another sad Bears fan. <laughs> and uh, you know she's refurbishing these and, and taking them to Kenya and, and using open educational resources to get kids educated and maybe get some college classes and stuff so learning has become increasingly available once the technology is there and open you know there is open this is the gateway to open access in Asia it has almost a thousand publishers 4,000 journals 37 countries to, for open access contents. Free and open in California. They're saving millions of dollars on textbooks in California. 23 community colleges have produced 34 zero cost textbooks, saving 42 million in California. Now that's something to talk about. It's not a mild, it's not a minor thing. That's a big thing, right? It's a big thing. OER experiments are making an impact, are making a difference. Open Educational Resources, OER, is something that this field people are has, is, are talking about. People are becoming aware of educational technology because it's saving them money. It's getting them access. It's engaging students in different ways. And instructors are starting, finally, professors are, are becoming more aware of this open education. Not only are they more aware of it, they're using it. And administrators. Five years ago, when I taught this class, the numbers were lower than this. There was data out there. Instructors were not confident in using open education, particularly US, European, they were using it. There are different studies out there and the European studies were much more optimistic than American ones. But today that's changed a bit. And uh, this is just September. Study finds increasing levels of buy-in of open ed, but questions on their efficacy remain. So. That's another week. I have a whole lecture on the efficacy or, you know, how are we going to maintain and sustain and up, up skill and all that. This is my free book. I mentioned it earlier. It's in the book, a stack of books. You can download it in Chinese or English, the tech variety model. Those are the 10 principles of motivation spells tech variety. Each one has each one of those principles has 10 examples, 10 activities in the book with a variation. So really 20 ideas. If you want to, if you want variety, if you want, to build engagement, if you want to build curiosity, get the chapter that you want. So Elaine and I, it's Elaine Co. on the right, we redid the book. We come up with a newer version of the book called Motivating and Supporting Online Learners. Shorter, it's online, and there's a free class training people on how to do motivate online. So we, so while online, while open, 
ness while OER is exploding, I've been contributing something to it or trying to. And so there are examples on how to build autonomy, how to build relevance, how to build curiosity, how to build attention and so forth with different activities like a jigsaw or flipping the classroom or a word cloud or a role play or whatever. Um, and most recently, my new special issue, which you'll read in week three, and with Vanessa Denon will come in and Mena Ju will come in, I think. We'll talk about this special issue number, you know, uh, week three, the second special issue that we did, systematic reviews of the research on online learning. So this is also free. And we put it up at EdTech Books. So EdTech Books is a resource, and that could be your final assignment, just critiquing EdTech Books, you know, and evaluating what you find. EdTech Books is free books instead of undergrad, instead of... IST students buying books, they've created a whole bunch of books that are free. My friends at Brigham Young University have were guests in 511 last year talking about EdTech books. His name is Jason McDonald and also Rick West. And um, there's a third person in the group, Royce Kimmins. They all came in and into my podcast show as well, talking about EdTech books, the free books that are available to help kids around the world. There's my World is Open book um, of various translations, Arabic and Chinese. And so now when people greet me in Singapore, they hold their hands up like this. When people, I go to Bangkok, they hold their hands up like this. And when I go to India, when I go to Indianapolis, when I go to, to Taiwan, they're all, everyone's holding up, you know, I'm sorry, Jill. And when I go to China, actually, you know, <laughs> this is this is the conference last, last month, some pictures I threw in here, just some, some cultural ones. You can see everyone's greet me in Japan and so forth and so on. <laughs> it's time to wake up. On the count of three, can everyone go with me? One, two, three. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. One, two, three. It's time it's to wake time up. To wake up. It's time to wake up. And I think we'll save part three for next time. Let's say it one more time. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And everyone like this, one time for tonight. One, let's get everyone together like this, up in the air, okay? One, two, three, gotcha, okay. To <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna stop the recording at this point and thank all of you for hanging around a little extra here. Um, I could keep going, but I think it's best to save the other uh, part for next week. And so 